parents angry, full of grief, of mourning, of red hot anger. Why? Because their teen girl, absolutely stunning, with a loving heart, musically so talented, their teen daughter, Jillian, is dead. Dead from a stray bullet fired by a career criminal. This little girl out just walking in a park on a track, minding her own business, she's dead. Dead at the hands of a career criminal that should have been behind bars. How many more times are we going to stand by and let this happen in our great country? How many more times will politicians get away with blah, 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 trying to explain why yet another innocent person is dead because the justice system failed because of overcrowding in jails, because of incompetence, of letting somebody walk that should have been doing hard jail time or at least in a facility. How can you, as a judge, as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, with a good conscience, in good conscience, let somebody walk out that courthouse door knowing they are a threat to others and doing nothing? If I had my way, which of course I don't, they'd all be behind bars along with the killer. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories on Sirius XM 111. What happened? Listen. Enjoying the beautiful weather in Nashville, Jillian Ludwig is walking on the track in Edge Hill Community Memorial Gardens Park at 2.30 in the afternoon when gunshots ring out across the street from the park. Not the intended target. She is hit in the head with a stray bullet and falls to the ground. Nobody else is on the track. Jillian Ludwig suffers for nearly an hour before she is found. A passerby finds Ludwig and calls for help at 3.30, and she's transported to Vanderbilt University Medical Center in very critical condition. All right there. I want to find out everything. Joining me in addition to family and friends of Jillian's family, first to Marissa Sulik, joining us out of Nashville with WSMV. Marissa, thank you for being with us. First of all, this is in broad daylight at 2.30 in the afternoon. 2.30 in the afternoon. Yep, you're right, Nancy. It was, she was out for a run, a walk, and me, I mean, I'm a runner too. I've ran past that park, and this just happened, and she was laying there for an hour before that passerby waved police down, and we've heard from police that they actually, someone at the precinct, which is right by that park as well, heard a bullet. They heard a gunshot, and someone went to go check it out, didn't find anything, and it took a whole hour for finally that passerby to wave someone down. So she lies there on this track for nearly an hour before anyone realizes she's been shot. To Jerry Wainwright, a special guest joining us, great aunt of Jillian, Jillian Ludwig, Ludwig. That's got to torture the mom and dad so much, knowing their daughter laid there and suffered before anyone even uh, found her. It does. It does. I have to say that we have all drawn some comfort um, from the fact that Jillian likely never saw it coming. Um, she had her AirPods on in. I'm sure she didn't hear the shots ring out. I know I've heard that there were six. I don't know if the first bullet hit her or the fourth or, but regardless, um, I think the element of surprise um, allows us to find some comfort in that, to know that she wasn't terrified or scared or attacked or that for her it was it was unexpected. And I believe from what I understand that she was unconscious from the moment she was hit um, and unaware. And that is 
reassuring somehow. I hope um, that you're right. Dr. Sherry Schwartz joining us, forensic psychologist specializing in victim advocacy and criminal cases. You can find her at panthermitigation.com. She is the author of Criminal Behavior and Where Law and Psychology Intersect, Issues in Legal Psychology. Dr. Sherry, I mean, to this day, I like to tell myself my fiance Keith didn't feel anything, didn't know anything, because he was shot five times in the head, the neck, the back. But he was actually alive, still alive. When his body, when he was transported to the hospital, he was alive when he got there. If I really look at it, in the cold light of day, he probably did feel much of what happened to him. You know, Nancy, I'm so sorry that that happened to you and sorry to Jillian Ludwig's family. The thing about what we know about what victims go through is that torture. And look how many years ago that you went through this and you still think about it. This is the kind of deep, complex trauma that li quite literally can torture victims and their loved ones. It is unconscionable that this happened and that the laws in place didn't protect Jillian and that her family has to suffer this tremendous loss. I just hate the road they're going down. It's a road that's going to last the rest of their lives because, you know, Dr. Sherry Schwartz, you know what, let me throw this to Andy Kahn joining me, a longtime colleague and now friend, Director of Victim Services and Advocacy at Crime Stoppers of Houston. Andy, a lot of times, even now, uh, and now I'm married to David. I have the twins that are my number one concern on this earth anyway. But I still wake up. And I think sometimes in the very early morning, around 5 o'clock when I normally wake up, I wake up thinking about Keith slumped over in that truck, having been shot so many times. And it's almost as if I'm feeling what he felt. Like, did it feel like just he got hit? in the head when he fell over did he realize what happened to him was he aware when paramedics put him on a gurney could he try to did he try to move his arms and legs and he couldn't did it hurt i mean this to this day and i guess that means i was dreaming about it because i'm thinking about it as i wake up and then when i look at the twins i think will anything happen to them today will they be safe you know it lasts a lifetime, Andy, as you know. You know, as a board member of the Houston chapter of Parents and Murdered Children, and I've been working and assisting homicide survivors now for over 30 years, you essentially, as you phrased it, you got a life sentence as well. This just doesn't go away. There is no such word like the media likes to use as closure. But for the Ludwig family, the grief is intensified because now you find out the background of the defendant who's now going to be charged with Jillian's murder. And the reality is, and this is how I phrase it, is the offender deserves his fair share of the blame. But frankly, I, I, I blame our incompetent. And this is probably the, the only time you're going to actually hear the word incompetent with the right usage. I blame the incompetence of the Tennessee justice system for allowing a known habitual violent offender with a rap sheet going back to 2011 with multiple convictions involving a gun and you put him right back in the same community knowing full well he's going to continue his criminal career. The state of Tennessee, from my perspective, is culpable and frankly even more complicit in the murder of Jillian. I this really ticked Did me off. Did you not just hear me say at the get go, I think they should all be in jail with him? Oh absolutely. I think there's an echo yeah. and that echo is Andy Khan. But you're right. How can you in good conscience I mean, Andy, after Keith's murder, I never discussed Keith's murder with anyone. I went through all my years of law school the finishing going, I dropped out of school, went back to college to finish. 
through two jobs before I made it to the DA's office. Do you know I was in the DA's office full 10 years in inner city Atlanta? I think I only confided to maybe two people the whole time I was there about what had happened to Keith. And do you know every time I even got so much as a theft by receiving a stolen vehicle, I would read the rap sheet and I would think with every case, is this guy going to get out and kill somebody? Is there any indication he's going to do that? Because if there is, he's going to jail for as long as I can keep him there. I don't know how in good conscience you could send this guy back out the courthouse door and now Jillian, beautiful teen Jillian, is dead. Listen. As Jillian Ludwig fights for her life in Vanderbilt University Medical Center, police arrest 29-year-old Shaquille Taylor According to a police affidavit, surveillance video and witness statements pointed to Taylor as the shooter. Video shows Ludwig falling as Taylor fires at a nearby car. Jillian Ludwig, the 18-year-old Belmont University freshman student, died overnight. Miss mm. Wainwright is with us. Miss Wainwright, when did you learn Jillian had died? I was there. I was at the hospital with her. Um, I had flown down that morning, um, on a 6 a.m. flight after I'd heard that she had been shot, uh, to be supportive of my family. So I knew in real time, um, it was, it was the worst day of my life without exception. Um, you know, we're talking about the shooter and the injustice of it all. And the reality is of this entire situation that, the people that deemed him unfit to stand trial yet not reaching whatever benchmark they have in place for involuntary commitment are most definitely at fault here because this man in his most recent, his most recent arrest was for shooting a gun at a car with a woman and two babies in it. Um, I'm not sure how anybody in their right mind could determine that he was not a danger to others. Did when you the say shooting at reason. a car with a lady and two children in the car, babies? Yes, a three-year-old and a one-year-old were in that car. He was arrested for aggravated assault in April for shooting at a car with a woman and two babies in it. Marissa and... Sulik, is this true? Yeah, absolutely mm-hmm. true. So they're he was saying he's... based on the fact that he was incompetent. So they're saying, well, he he's not incompetent a to, to stand others. trial, but but that he was not a danger to others, and he clearly what what would do you, what do you have to do to prove that you're a danger to others when you've shot at human beings in a car? So they don't send him How, to jail, and they don't send him to a facility to treat him. Neither one. No, Nancy, so Nancy, Nancy, in this in May of twenty three, that's when they released him from custody on the aggravated assault with the deadly one he shot into the car. And here's where it gets even more infuriating because four months later in September, he's charged with auto theft as part of a carjacking ring. So now you're charged with another felony, but you're deemed suitable to be released on bail. After three months, you were just declared incompetent, yet you're released on bail. And of course, he doesn't show up the next day. You're preaching to... The choir, Matthew Mangino, I hear you jumping in, but I want you to hear something else, Matthew. Um, You're hearing Jerry Wainwright, who is the great aunt of Jillian, teen girl Jillian Ludwig, who has now passed away. This is a heavily residential area. And this guy, the defendant, is shooting a gun at a car. Again, we've had a carjacking. We've had him shooting at a car with a lady and her two babies in the car. Now he shoots at a car again, and he ends up shooting this beautiful girl, Jillian. Jerry, when did you learn she had been shot? Where were you? I was at work on Tuesday night. Um, My niece called me at work. And at first said that Jillian, uh, because we didn't know, she said that she had been hurt. And that she was in the hospital and, uh, you know, we rushed to get her, to get her on a flight. And, um, and then I texted my, uh, then my niece called me back and said, she's been shot in the head. She's been, been hysterical. She's been shot in the head. And I just said, 
you know, but I mean, what, what do you say to that? It was, it was unconscionable, right? Like that isn't even possible. Um, so I told her that I would be there on the first flight in the morning and I got on a 6 a.m. flight. Um, and at that point they had told us that she likely wouldn't survive the injury. And, um, and I was just hoping to make it there while she was still, still with us. Um, and yes, she died later that day at 6:29 PM. Actually, she was pronounced dead. And, um, so another, another point that I would like to make about the criminal involved in this is that in our justice system, if in fact they determined that this man had the intelligence or the, the intellectual capacity of a five-year-old, which I find hard to believe because he certainly was adept around guns, right? Um, but if in fact that was true, even children in our society, if a child uses a gun in a violent crime, they're detained to a juvenile detention facility. They're not just set free. Um, so where is, where is the logic in all of this? There where is, is none. the there is none. sanity? And I hope the people responsible for letting him walk are just as sick as I am right now, hearing it times a hundred. Guys, we are talking about a beautiful teen girl who is out in a park walking the track in a heavily residential area, minding her own business, 2.30 in the afternoon. What's interesting also, uh, Andy Kahn, is we keep hearing, oh, Jillian was not the intended victim. Okay, I actually had a case where a, a teen boy was coming home from band practice and a doper, two dopers, shot him dead. And guess what their defense was at trial? <laughs> it's are very you, similar. Are I you can well imagine. Yes. Because when I was, it was when transferred I was a, intent, Andy. Oh, I meant to shoot Jackie, but I killed Sydney instead. That's not a defense. I meant to I kill. That's all that matters. For, I had a guy on parole for murder, and he looked at me and he goes, Mr. Khan, I want you to know I didn't kill that guy. I didn't mean to kill that guy. I meant to kill the other guy. And I was like, okay, what do you want me to do, pardon you? <laughs> Guys, who is this beautiful girl? Who is Jillian? Listen to our friends at CrimeOnline.com. Jillian Ludwig is passionate about music. Having graduated from Wall High School in June, Jillian Ludwig enjoys time with friends and boyfriend as she prepares to leave for Nashville and college life. She loves the beach, nature, music, and performing in the local places Ludwig arrives on campus at Belmont University for her freshman year and immediately impacts the local music scene. In her first weeks of college, she settled into a routine playing lots of music, but also getting outside and enjoying the weather. Nashville is a big change from her native New Jersey, and Jillian Ludwig loves jogging and walking around the park. Can you imagine, here she is going off to college. It's a beautiful, beautiful fall day, November 7th. And she is out loving life, loving life, minding her own business in a park in a heavily residential area when shots ring out. But in researching and asking questions about Jillian, I find out that she was loving and giving and the apple of everyone's eye, even as a little girl. Listen. Growing up in Jersey, Jillian found joy and gave joy through music. She sang and served as cantor for years at St. Mark's Church in Seagirt, was very involved with Lake House Music Academy in Asbury Park, singing and playing guitar and bass with multiple bands, as well as teaching young music students, playing local music spots like Stone Pony and Asbury Lanes, as well as some gigs in New York City. Music led her to initiate a service project called Playing It Forward. She would play her music at a local venue, then donate all the proceeds, including tips, to organizations helping musicians in need, including children. Children that did not have access to instruments or music education like she had access. She actually wanted to help other people. Uh, you know, it makes me think of my mom. Uh, they grew up dirt poor. My mom was a musical superstar. Someone paid, an anonymous donor to this day, we don't know who it was, paid for her music education from first grade 
all the way till she studied at Wesleyan College for Women. She never knew who donated that. She went on to play in the symphony and become a professional musician. That is what this young girl was doing for other children, giving up her own tips, her own money she'd make playing to help these children that had no music education, that couldn't afford instruments. That's who Jillian Ludwig was. Now, who is her killer, her alleged killer? Take a listen to our cut six. Shaquille Taylor, the man arrested in the shooting death of Jillian Ludwig, is someone well known to law enforcement with a record stretching back more than a decade. His latest arrest was on September 21st, driving a Ford F-150 pickup truck that had been carjacked by two men wearing ski masks. Taylor was charged with felony auto theft and was released on a $20,000 bond. Taylor was due in court just days before the shooting of Jillian Ludwig, but failed to show up. A failure to appear warrant was issued, and that was the added charge to Taylor's arrest in the shooting death of Ludwig. So, bottom line, uh, Marissa Sulek joining us from WSMV in Nashville. We always call them BFs, bond forfeiture. When you don't show up to court, you get arrested. I don't care where you are. You are found and arrested. And this guy was a stone's throw of where he always is. But he wasn't picked up and brought in. Isn't that true, Marissa? Yeah, I mean, and we have done extensive reporting on this just weeks before Jillian was killed. Our I team, our investigative team found out after they talked with Glenn Fung, the district attorney, that there are 229 criminals like Taylor just roaming the streets here in Nashville that have been deemed incompetent to stand trial. So that means they don't understand how a jury works. Technically, they don't know how lawyers work. So this is very frustrating that they don't have the funding. They don't have the funding to get them these evaluations, the training. They've gone to lawmakers, except the Senate didn't end up passing that this past session. So they're trying to bring it back in January. But even Glenn Funk, the district attorney, said just a couple weeks ago before Jillian was killed, he told our chief investigative reporter, Jeremy Finley, that it's just a matter of time before someone else is hurt. And then this happened. They let it happen. Well, Joining me, high-profile lawyer Matthew mm -hmm. Mangino, former district attorney, Lawrence County, author of The Executioner's Toll. Matthew, jump in. Well, Nancy, you know, certainly I understand this process uh, to determine whether somebody is competent or, or, or incompetent to stand trial. They can't aid in their own defense, and there's uh, evaluations done, and that determination is made that, that they're not competent to be tried. The second issue, though, with this individual is, should he have been on the street? Should, should there have been a, an involuntary commitment of him uh, because yes. of his dangerousness, uh, which he had demonstrated through his criminal record? And I don't see, when I look at these media reports, that there was ever a psychiatric um, detention hearing. You know, you can involuntarily involuntarily commit somebody for three days and then you have a hearing uh, in, in front of a, a master or a judge that person can then be held for an additional 15 days but you there's criteria to, that you have to meet that the two doctors say that that individual uh, is dangerous to the community was that ever even done well I can I give mean, you a little bit of the history Matthew Mangino mm -hmm. um, actually take a listen to this Shaquille Taylor has a criminal history dating back to 2011. Police seized a 40 caliber handgun from Taylor when he was a juvenile. In 2015, Taylor was charged with robbery and given probation. Taylor violated the terms of his probation, charged with aggravated burglary, and was sentenced to a year in jail in 2016. In 2021, Taylor was arrested and charged with aggravated assault when he fired a gun into a car with two children in the back seat. In May of 2023, he was released from custody after three court-appointed psychologists deemed him incompetent to stand trial, but also found he didn't pose threat to himself or others. He admitted to detectives in 2021 that he did it. And more. Listen. Shaquille Taylor, 29, has an intellectual disability and language impairment, according to records. With that determination, it means he isn't able to participate in a trial where he's accused of shooting into a car in 2021. Besides the intended target, the car that he shot into had two children in the back seat, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. 
Taylor even admitted to detectives in 2021 that he did it. Taylor spent time in jail being interviewed by doctors, but they all agreed that what is called further training or medical care would not change his competency. So despite admitting to detectives that he shot into a car with children inside, charges were dismissed and he was released from custody. We just covered the case of cult mom Lori Vallow, who was deemed incompetent to stand trial. All that means is at the time of trial, you are not able to assist your lawyer in your own defense. That does not mean you're insane. It means you're incompetent to stand trial at that moment. So what did they do with cult mom Lori Vallow? They kept her behind bars and got her ready to the point that she was competent. So here, even though this guy keeps shooting at people, over and over and carjacking, shooting at cars, committing one crime after the next. They don't put him in a facility for the mentally impaired and they don't put him in jail. Their answer is to put him back on the street, Andy Khan. You know, in Texas, you remain committed. And I'm fairly sure that in most states, you remain committed until you're deemed competent to stand trial. You just don't get punted right back to the community. And how do you explain incompetency when a defendant evidently has no problems driving all around Nashville, firing off guns, he's got a girlfriend, he lives on his own? Explain how that is deemed incompetent. Look, Whoa, Julian wait. Lives, he lives, drives yeah. a car, lives on his own, and has a girlfriend? Yes. Okay, yes, Dr. Sherry Schwartz, this is not a guy with the mind of a five-year-old. He's got a girlfriend, mm -hmm. drives a car, has a driver's license, and lives on his own. Exactly, and we know he knows how to use a gun and likes using guns. So I, as a forensic mental health professional, I'm over here just inside screaming because I, I'm sorry, I don't see how you arrive at the conclusion as a forensic mental health professional that this is not someone who poses a danger to society. I also I want agree. to point out that he, um, he worked at a local fast food restaurant with someone that we actually spoke with, and she was like, he was normal and fine. There was nothing that said that he was five years old or at least acted like a kindergartner according to some evaluations. Okay, you're hearing Marissa Sulik with WSNV. Could you please say that again? Who in the H E double -L, L said this guy was incompetent? He works at a fast food restaurant. He w lives on his own. He has a girlfriend. He has a driver's license. He drives a car and he knows how to shoot a gun. Help yeah. me. Marissa, what more can you tell me about him working at a fast food restaurant? Well, we talked with actually um, a friend of his that worked at that fast food restaurant, which is actually just right by our station, and she was shocked. I mean, this, she found out maybe a few days after Jillian was killed, that, and when she saw his mugshot, she was like, wait, I, I actually work with this guy, um, and it happens to be someone we all know at the station, so... She was like, yeah, he's totally fine. We, he has, like, his brother's a manager there, everything. He acts completely normal. But still, there's three doctors, according to court documents, that still deem him incompetent to stand trial. Now, it's my understanding that, uh, Marissa Sulek, and you may be able to shed light on this, that his family, Shaquille Taylor's family, says the system has failed him. Yeah, you're right. We've spoken with his grandmother, and I've seen his mom and dad in the courtroom for a hearing that he did not appear in because he waived his first appearance. But, um, yeah, they they straight up told us the system has failed their son or grandson. Okay. Uh, to Jerry Wainwright, she is yeah. the great aunt of Jillian Ludwig, who is almost like a pawn in this whole thing. We're not even talking about her and her musical talents, and how her family loved her, and how she was the apple of their eye, and how she's minding her own business, going for a jog slash walk at a park in a heavily residential area when this guy 
she killed Taylor, opens fire and kills her. And now we learn he's not incompetent at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jerry, do her parents have any idea about what we're learning now from Marissa Sulik? We know. We know everything that's been reported. We've been staying abreast of all the all the reporting, and I have, you know, spoken to Marissa at length. Um, the it, it's just it's mind numbing to think that it all was preventable, that she could have lived. I mean, Jillian was she was all those things, all the things that we mentioned. She was kind and loving and she was so smart and so funny and she had a laugh that could just light up the world um i never heard anyone say a bad word about her she was literally she was 18 years old and she was the best person i know inside have, outside jerry she was i got a question for you have you sure. seen the photo of whom we believe is Shaquille yeah. taylor and he is standing with who we think is his brother posing, uh, making uh, something like gang signs with his hands, and the brother is showing a huge roll of money? I have not seen that. I have seen his mug shot. Um, this no, is from I, straight I off his... of Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there's any question that he is someone that should not have been on the street. I believe that there are people that need to be held responsible for this. I believe that it was a, a total failure of a system that should be designed to protect the public at large. It should be designed to protect innocent people. People should be able to live their life in broad daylight without fear of being gunned down by somebody who has no business being on the street. Andy Kahn, I would like to, for you to take a look at this photo that I just sent you. This is yeah, who I, I believe I, to be Shaquille Taylor <laughs> on the left, his brother on the right. They look like, you know, have you seen the uh, pictures that gang members or perps post of themselves, like showing all the money they just got? Yeah. You, you see that picture I just sent you, Andy Kahn? I, I this do. is the guy they said is it. incompetent? I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know, look, he's flashing. He's proud of himself. He wants the whole world to know who he is. And it's what from he his is. Facebook. He has Facebook. Yes. The guy Correct. they say has a mind of a five-year-old has a Facebook and posts pictures of this himself is what makes flashing this money. So maddening. It is. Well, 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 my Nancy. question. My question to everybody here and to Nancy. Obviously, this is an ultimate tragedy, yet this was so utterly preventable. Will Jillian's death be a catalyst for change? It has to be. This cannot continue to happen. There needs to be a law, and it needs to be named the Jillian Ludwig Law. Well, Nancy, that, I think that's exactly what, what has to happen here. Obviously, the law... Uh, as it is, as it exists in Tennessee, uh, is inadequate because it, it provides that if a doctor or doctors say that someone is incompetent, they can't aid in their defense. The judge has no alternative but to dismiss the case, and that has to change. Uh, and and you would think that Nashville he doesn't have Tennessee to dismiss the case when someone is de determined incompetent. He can be yeah. held until he is competent. Right. I mean, did anybody well, see the Facebook picture that we just pulled up all on our own? It's him. And he's with a guy flashing money. Okay? He's not incompetent. He works at a fast food I restaurant. Understand. He lives on his own. He has a girlfriend, a driver's license. He drives. He gets access to guns. And he shoots them over and over and over. That is not the mind of a five-year-old child. What, but the problem is, Nancy, and as you know that these are these decisions are based on medical evidence and that if a doctor comes in uh, and does a forensic assessment and says that this person has no ability or limited ability to, to uh, aid in his own defense, the court 
has to make that determination based on medical evidence. Actually, but that's it, partially true because I recall distinctly a murder that was set up to look like a suicide and the defendant was deemed incompetent to stand trial. And I, I'm not an MD, I'm not a shrink, I went and got evidence on my own of letters he was writing to friends, co-workers, talking about how he was going to stay in the mental facility for X number, I think he said two years, while he made sand paintings, you know those sand paintings you put in a bottle, and did artwork, and then he would get out. I got every letter I could find of his to show he was not incompetent. And when presented with that evidence, doctors had a very different opinion, just as I think they would if they had this evidence that we're talking about right now, Matthew Mangino. That's BS. Well, why wasn't it presented? Don't uh, I don't you know, know why it wasn't presented. Andy Kahn, I think the failure, help me though, find the answers. Is, the, the failure in the law is that if you deem someone incompetent, it should not mean that the case is dismissed, and that's what Tennessee law uh, apparently provides. There should be some other method, whether it is civil uh, um, commitment because of a, a mental health issue and a risk to others. The, th th these things should work hand in hand. They shouldn't be, well, here we're going to deal with incompetency, all, and, and if you bring it up, we'll, we'll deal with the issue uh, of uh, danger to, to society. These should work hand in hand, and they don't. And that has to change on a legislative Okay, thank you for preaching. Tennessee. These people screwed up, Andy Kahn. If you and I and the people here at Crime Stories can dig up this evidence, if Marissa Sulek can dig up this evidence, they can dig up the evidence. And they let this guy and walk out, and now Jillian is dead. And that's why I said the state of Tennessee is equally, if not more, than complicit and culpable in her death for knowing, knowingly allowing a career habitual violent a felon right back to the community to do what he does best, commit crimes. And this time, 18-year-old Jillian Ludwig paid the ultimate price. Something's got to give. Back to Jerry Wainwright joining us, the great aunt of Jillian Ludwig. Yeah. Jerry, sometimes I feel that there, you don't know what to say, not only because Jillian has passed away, not only because her parents are grieving, but because it was all so avoidable if the prosecutor, the doctors, the defense attorney and the judge had done their job, but they didn't, and now Jillian is dead, it can only add to the grief that her parents are suffering. Uh, it, it does. It does. Um, you know, we even, we haven't had Jillian's funeral yet. Um, so they're still trying to process. We're all still trying to process and get over that hurdle. Um, but yes, it's, it is maddening. It's, uh, um, you know, something like so. So something like this, violent crime like this, usually doesn't hit home for most of us. When it happens, it's somebody else's life, some other place, some other, some other story, and everybody feels bad about it, and we're empathetic. And but when it hits home, and you never, you could never expect or plan or prepare for it the shock and the grief and the depths of their sorrow are overwhelming. Um, and, and yes, the fact that it is, that it was preventable does, it, it, it makes us angry, very, very angry. Um, you know, they sent their, they sent their daughter away into the world to live her best life, to be something great. And, and she would have, she would have done amazing things with her life. And um, the fact that that other people's uh, incompetency um, contributed to her her death is yeah it's it's heartbreaking um, it's earth shattering. Andy Kahn. And 
what, I, sometimes we don't have the answer. You know, I've worked with so many victims' families and crime victims themselves, and they look to us, prosecutors, investigators, as having some kind of an answer. I don't know the answer. I don't have an answer right now. The only answer is what we've already know, is that the state of Tennessee failed Jillian. Now the only question is, are we going to allow them to continue to fail other families? It's my understanding that they resume legislative back in session in January. This needs to be priority legislation on the fast track, and they need to name a law after her so no other family has to endure the pain, grief, and agony of losing a loved one to this insane, and that's what this is, insane decision. Let's just wait and see whether the Tennessee legislature, packed with politicians, has the backbone to do anything about it. But for now, our prayers for Jillian's family go on. Well, thank you. Goodbye, friends. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.